How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of your favorite Swim Bait Podcast, Scales and Tails, episode 143 today. We're joined by a gentleman from California who, uh, who maybe you guys are familiar with if you guys watch the Optimum uh, Optimum YouTube videos, or maybe if you guys just uh, follow California Swim Bait Fishing a little bit. We're joined by Mr. Jeff. Jeff, is it is it Clo? Is that how you say your last name? Actually, Clough, but you know, Clough, my Clough. whole life, everybody said just because of how it's spelled, it totally looks like Clo or Clough. Dude, I, I've, like, when I talk to people, that's how I say your last name, <laughs> because that's what I always thought it was like. <laughs> Everybody says that, so yeah. It, I, I actually had a friend in high school that had the same spelling last name, and they pronounced it Clow. I was like, okay, maybe we're wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who knows? Oh, uh, dude, that's funny. Right? So we're joined by Jeff. Like I said, if you guys watch Optimum's Instagram or even their uh, their YouTube stuff, I'm sure you see see him or at least familiar with his face a little bit. So I guess Jeff, to get uh, get the people kind of introduced to who you are, we'll start off with who you are and what do you do. All right, my name's Jeff Clough. I was born in 1973. <laughs> Makes me 50, almost 51. Um, what do I do? I fish. I work at Optimum Baits. I've been working there for almost two years now. Uh, I've been on Matt's pro staff for 10 plus years. I really honestly don't have a timeline on that, but I know it's 10 plus years. <laughs> and, you know, I just like a lot of you guys out there, I dream for that big fish. You know, I like to chase trophies. Heck yeah, man. That's a good, a good solid introduction. So I guess did... We'll start from the beginning so people can kind of know who you are a little bit if they didn't listen to the Cast and Crank episode. So you currently live in California. Is that where you were born and grew up at and kind of learned how to fish and everything there? Yeah, I was born and raised in Southern California. I went to San Clemente High School. I worked uh, for Dana Wharf Sport Fishing when I was younger, mostly because my dad did. He worked for Dana Wharf for 44 years, and I started working as a deckhand when I was in junior high with him. And... You know, my love for fishing basically came from my dad. You know, he he fished my whole life, and I'm pretty sure most of his life. And it was just something that was always there for me. It was something that there was always a passion for. I don't even, I can't even tell you what my first fish was. I've had people ask me, I don't even know. Man, that's a, that no sounds clue. like a good, uh, good start to it. That's for sure. Right. Well, when your day carries on a party boat, it's pretty good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So it sounds like you were brought up with the whole saltwater thing, right? Being from SoCal and everything and, and being on the boats. Yep. Yep. That was uh, saltwater fishing until, oh, man, I would say. 25 plus years ago when i started fishing freshwater okay so yeah i'm 50 yeah i was probably about 25 dang dude so i guess growing up saltwater fishing did you ever think that you were gonna kind of get into the freshwater stuff actually when i was younger no <laughs> and it's mostly because back then they had i don't know if you remember them but all the freshwater rods were like these weird pistol grips. Mm. And I hated them. They were like, the, the butt was like super small. There was no butt to it. It was just a pistol grip that you held. And that was a kid, you know, my early teens thinking, oh, that stuff's just lame. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, and you'd see guys come out on the boat and they would throw a Rapala or something. You're like, what are you doing? That thing's just, that's just not right. You know, because yeah. back then it was different. You didn't have as much of a crossover as you do now. You know, throwing crankbaits for spotties and stuff like that, you know? Right. Dang, dang. So I guess uh, when when you finally turned turn the uh turn the page and got into the freshwater stuff, how did that start? Did that just kind of start of, you know, maybe I want to go catch a bass here and there, or kind of where did that, where did the freshwater scene kind of cross over for you? Um, it was literally the first day that I went, it was, I got definitely, uh, a, a lucky day. It was wide open. I mean, I probably had 50 fish wow. and they, they were just chewing a jerk bait. Like you've never seen just on it. 
And I was like, wow, this is really awesome. I even stuck, I think, a four and a half. It was right about that. We didn't win, but right about four and a half. And I was just like, wow, this is so awesome. And none of my gears filthy and dirty and salty. And I don't have to go take all my reels apart as soon as I get home. Oh, yeah. Once that happened, it was like game on. I started trying to find ponds, golf courses, everything I could do to fish freshwater. Damn. Was that like, was it too shitty of a day to go out out on the ocean? Or what was the reason you had gone that day? It was just something my dad brought up. He's like, hey, you want to go fish a lake? And I'm like, all right. It was a, it was a private lake that's in uh like oso it's oso reservoir it's now it's ran by the boy scouts but back then we had access through uh shimano because hmm. my dad's really good friends with the president of shimano america and uh we got invited just to go so I'm like yeah i'll go check it out yeah it was incredible absolutely incredible experience that's probably a lot of what pushed it is I mean, when you see a foamer of largemouth that's like literally 50 feet by 50 feet and they're pushing the shad up onto the beach and beaching themselves to get it. That was my first experience, freshwater largemouth fishing. I had fished, you know, for trout, bluegill or whatever, you know, when I was younger, you know, we'd go camp every year and just go catch anything we could. But that was the start of the actual love for largemouth. Dang, dude. So... Once you had that experience, did uh did you go out to a lake or a pond and be like what the hell this isn't this isn't what I had or did you kind of ha- did you kind of know from that day forward that that was a pretty crazy day and it, it was going to be few and far between moving forward for like other bodies yeah. of water and stuff? Yeah, well, I mean, I knew fishing, so that's kind of a given. You don't have that. I mean, kind of craziness, but after that, it was. Uh... My dad and I started going to the river once a year, Colorado River. I got to always make sure I explain that. People say, the river, what river are you talking about? But yeah, the Colorado River, we'd go to the lower end and fish out of like Lake Martinez area. And we started doing that. And that was every year. We went at the end of April, beginning of May. And that's just, that place is my happy place. I'd rather go there, I think, than anywhere. Right, yeah. That's where I'm going tomorrow. <laughs> Your favorite swim bait podcast is now proudly sponsored by Leviathan Rods. Leviathan Rods is a Texas based fishing rod company that's handcrafted and uses high end, made in the USA rod blanks. Every sale from Leviathan helps support foster youth and their families. With Leviathan Rods, you're not only going to feel a difference, but you're going to help make a difference too. Friends of the show will also get 20% off their rod purchases by using code SCALES20 at checkout. So whether you're fishing a depth 250 or a square bill, make sure you're using the best rod choice out there, Leviathan Rods. Staring at that peanut butter and jelly like a largemouth staring at a dollar store worm? Then it's time to upgrade your snackuation. Meat Crafters line of handmade, small batch, pre-sliced salami and charcuterie make the perfect base for your weekend snackle box. Fill a Plano 3600 with an assortment of Meat Crafters old world style salami and charcuterie and you're sure to become the boat ramp champ. Listeners of Scales and Tails can use Scales and Slices at checkout on MeatCrafters.com to save yourself 10% off your cart. The code can be used as many times as you want, so you'll never run out of fuel in your pursuit of giants. The next time you reach into the fridge to load up your boat cooler, skip the fish food and grab a stack of Meat Crafters pre-sliced snacks. They are guaranteed to exceed your PB. The vast majority of double-digit bass caught in Mexico are caught out of two lakes, Lake Bacarac and Lake El Salto. Josh Daniels Pro Bass Adventures is the only outfitter in Mexico with lodges on both of these trophy lakes. With a fleet of ranger boats at Lake El Salto and Live Scope Plus at Lake Baccarat, Pro Bass Adventures has the best equipped guides and boats in Mexico. Better call Pro Bass, 480-491-9300 or probassadventures.com. We are Mexico Fishing. Back shop colors at the beginning of every month. Also, Orders over $50 get free shipping, including rods. So do me a favor and remember to use code SCALES at checkout to save 10% at lakeprotackle.com. Heck yeah, dude. So get out there and like from that day forward, was it just kind of freshwater mindset? Like I want to go out and I want to catch these bass because they're just so badass. Yeah, that's one thing that made me love them so much is they're such an aggressive fish and they eat everything they literally eat everything you know birds snakes 
muskrats. I've watched them blow up on muskrats at the river, and it's just awesome. They're an aggressive fish, you know, and at the same time, they're a challenge to catch. So the whole side of that is what makes me be passionate about them. Right. How uh, how long after that day that you and your dad had gone out there did you turn around and go go to the sports shop and and buy a freshwater bass set up? Um. Well, at that point, I had access to all of it um, through Shimano. Actually, we were on a uh little staff that they had. It was uh, what did we do? What do they call it? We basically tested all their stuff. Okay. And I got that connection through my dad, you know, where his his best friend at the time, or one of his best friends was, you know, Shimano America. And so I got rods and reels and from them and dad had a bunch still. So I took some of those and the way I went, started getting baits. And then it, it didn't take me long to get into the the JDM thing either, because I started going online and you know, this is back when you couldn't find a mega bass bait anywhere Mm -hmm. you know and i would go online i used to shop at a place called uh ichiban tackle in japan mine and yeah and i started getting everything i could lucky craft japan you know bass day evergreen all that duo all that crazy stuff that you see here now it's different but yeah that's uh definitely this actually this cabinet right here is full of it damn all my, you know that's all my old school poppers uh crankbaits stuff like that because now i pretty much i'll still throw some of it here and there but not very often right so was this like uh late 90s early 2000s around that time oh man i gotta think <laughs> I say it was probably early 2000s. Okay. Because 2024, it might have been, it's either super early 2000s or super late 90s. Okay. It's yeah, was... kind of hard to judge that. I'm trying to think like what vehicle I had back right. then. I was, so I was trying to do the math. Help. Yeah, it's, it was a long time ago. We'll just say that. Right. I don't want to be like, I, I don't think I could be accurate on the date because yeah. it's, been, it's a lot of years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what uh, was, was it uh, a challenge to order off uh, Ichiban back then? Like, was it translated to English really well or kind of USD or was it more so just into your credit card information and, and pick up what you want and whatever you got charged, you got charged. Um, No, it, it wasn't hard. I, I remember buying from them was probably, early 2000s now that i'm thinking about it um but yeah it, it I never had any problems with them actually actually one time i sent him a picture and of a fish that i caught on their bait and they put me on their cover page i said like, cool <laughs> <laughs> got, me, got me pretty excited about that it's like that's cool that's awesome dude that's awesome do you remember your uh like because i guess i guess especially back then you probably didn't know about the JDM stuff unless you were on Ichiban or maybe you, maybe Bassmaster like had an article about certain stuff or you heard pros fishing it. Was it more, was it kind of like logging onto this site and kind of losing your shit with how much stuff they had in Japan that we don't have here? Oh yeah. Well, it started because my dad had a few, he had a few JDM baits and I just liked everything about them, the way they looked, the way they worked, you know, the different paint jobs and everything, just the style. I absolutely loved it. And after that, I started hunting it down and hunting it down and seeing where I could find. And I don't remember where else I used to get it. There was another place that I actually found before Ichiban. I can't, I actually can't remember the name because I haven't seen it around in years. Hmm. Damn. Yeah, I guess kind of, you kind of take it for granted that you can go on Instagram now and, and follow a Japanese bait maker and jump on his site and buy something. And it shows up in two weeks. I, I guarantee that is not exactly what it was like back then. No, no, it definitely wasn't. But you know, actually the pricing's pretty close, you know, like 
the JDM stuff, like even for a popper back then, you're paying anywhere between 16 and 20 bucks. Yeah. That's you know? about what it is now. I think a pop R is probably like right around 24 bucks. So really not much has changed. I can't imagine in the last 20, 20 some years. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you remember getting your first 110? I, I don't know when those came out, but I know that, that it was probably a JDM bait more than it was a U.S. bait when it first had come out. I actually don't. I actually don't remember getting it. One of my favorite jerk baits back in the day was it was a uh, made by Daiwa. It was a double clutch. Okay. It was a deep, deeper diving jerk bait. They haven't made it in a long time, but that was a really good one that I found on there. Hmm. Did uh did you get into the any of the tournament fishing or anything after you got into the freshwater stuff? I really wanted to at first, but I didn't have a boat. I just fished with my dad, you know, for the most part and pond hopped. That's all I had access to. Um and at first I really wanted to and I did one tournament with my buddy because his dad got sick and he asked me to fill in. And I was like, all right, no problem. So I fill in and it was cool. I mean, we didn't destroy it or anything. I think we got like 16th out of like 70 boats, 70 something boats. It was okay. I, the experience was neat, but not me. It's right. not my stuff. You know, not, I like to go out peacefully by myself, do my thing and try to catch one fish. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm out there to catch one fish. If I catch more, it's awesome. But, Right. I just want one. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like everybody, um, especially like, you know, kids my age, uh, 20, 20 some year olds, you growing up in, in tournament fishing was the big thing. You know, everybody, if, if you were going to be successful in the fishing industry, you were going to be the Kevin Van Dams or the Rick Cluns or, you know, whoever it was. But now you look at the fishing industry and, and there's, you can, make it big on Instagram, YouTube, tournament fishing. You can be a bait builder. I mean, there's there's such a – it almost seems like a bigger form of entry rather than what people knew about 20 years ago. And I feel like tournament fishing is still kind of the main thing that, that kids aspire to be, but there's a lot more options now, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, So after, after your tournament days, I guess, when did you find out about swim baits after you got into it? Well, the funny thing is I've been asked that question a lot and I really don't have a definitive answer because I was throwing swim baits for calicos in the eighties. You know, oh, you want to go back yeah. to worm kings and all that stuff. So honestly, when I started fishing fresh water, when I found any swim baits, I would use them. Mm -hmm. Um, I would have to say it's close on my first real hard bodied swim bait was either a 316 or i had a friend that was good friends with bill simmental and i got a prototype of the bbz one okay and i think they were both released in about 2006 so i i can't really tell you which one was my first but right in that area yeah so that was back when mickey still lived over there and whatnot so yeah that was that was a decent yep. decent while ago I was probably about five or six still shitting in diapers around that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he lived in he lived in Anaheim at that time. And actually, I had his number on my phone and I would call him and he sent me one time a bunch of his frogs. His frog was awesome. And you know, he sent me a couple other things. You know, that was back in the day when bait makers weren't swarmed. You know what I mean? Where yeah. it was like, oh yeah, somebody likes my stuff. Awesome. Right my number you know oh that's awesome that's funny man so i guess being in socal did you like kind of hear the rumblings of the huddleston and, and kind of uh that sort of thing in the early 2000s like when you were getting into the bass fishing scene did you hear guys talking about the huddleston and kind of some of these other you know the castaic and stuff like that oh yeah oh yeah i I used to throw huds remember i lost four in one day that was brutal but yeah I I still have a couple. I don't throw them that often anymore because I try to. Most of the time, I try to stick with optimum depths. Yeah, I'm a stuff. I try to stick with that, but I mean, I do throw the specialty bait maker stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, certain times. Well, most of the time on uh, when I'm out, I'll have 
some optimum on the deck and then maybe a phony frog you know yeah ds customs i like all those guys fin baits but yeah oh yeah dude so was it uh was it common back then, you know, that 2006, 2010 time to go out to a pond or a lake and, and seeing guys hucking swim baits? I feel like where you were, it was probably the most common. Like you weren't, you weren't as surprised to see it there than if you were in Alabama at the time, seeing guys toss a hut or something like that. It was, it was kind of more of a, uh, just a more common site where you are. I'm not gonna lie. I don't remember seeing anybody throw a big swim bait until probably after 2010 11 oh really okay oh, i didn't it wasn't something i saw a lot of at all mm -hmm. i would see friends i was with or something like that but it wasn't most of the ponds i'd go fish were well legal and i'd sneak in so there would be nobody there or you know a golf course or something and then when i was in a boat i was with my dad and he's right. not throwing like that so yeah i didn't really see a lot of that until i would say after 2010 when I started meeting more people mm. once i became pro staff for matt and and you know working the shows and seeing more of that side of things then i started to see it a lot more okay before that it was like i could say i was in a bubble i don't know it's, it's just one of those things it was like just did my own thing right you know didn't bring cameras with me everybody asks that it's like oh it used to be bad luck to bring a camera with you on a right. boat you didn't want to bring a camera because then you're not going to catch anything oh that's funny man so we'll we'll back it up a second uh that 2006 like when you got the uh the 316 baits and and, and that sort of thing do you remember like your first trip going out or, or i guess reword that was the first trip you went out with the 316 like were you catching fish or did it take a little while to kind of get in the groove of the big swim baits compared to the stuff that you had been fishing oh man i'm trying to remember i know i went out i don't know if it was like the first day but i know i went out to a pond and did pretty well on it right nothing big you know three or four pounders it was uh the 316 was the uh the wake junior i think and baby bass and i had this pond that there, i don't think there was anything with bass in it so they were, were very big and eating baby bass colors yeah and yeah probably went out and caught quite a few of them there <laughs> i mean that bait worked really well there so i don't remember the actual first day though right yeah when i guess uh Whereas now if somebody, if somebody went out and had a day or had like a, had a trip like that, where they catch a bunch of decent sized fish out on a swim bait and kind of, you know, not to be, not to be a dick or anything, but guys will, will flip a switch and swim bait or die type thing, you know, from here on out, sell all my conventional gear. Was that something that you went through at that point in time? Or did you kind of know it was just a tool? Um, I went through it quite a bit. The big back seating, my dad, I couldn't always throw a swim bait because he's a big crankbait guy so he was go fast so at that point in time my favorite swim bait was a triple trout mm -hmm. because you could work it faster um i would go back and forth like i'd find spots i'd throw it and then i'd pick up you know frog whatever depending on what time of year it was and you know pick my angles mm -hmm. um when i became pretty much 95 percent swim bay once i got my boat really yeah which honestly hasn't been that long i mean fishing ponds and everything i would always have a swim bait but still not having a boat kind of held that back quite a bit because you know you're going to a pond you want to catch fish hiking out there so bring a swim bait rod and then this and this and this whatever you catch your first fish on you end up throwing for a little bit <laughs> right yeah <laughs> What the what was your swim bait set up at the time in back in the early days? Oh man. It was God, it was a saltwater rod and I can't remember what it was. No, I was I was, I I figured that's what it was. <laughs> yeah, and then and then Shimano came out with a crucial swim bait rod, which I actually have. And I want to say it was roughly about does it bother you if I walk around? No, no, you're good. 
Um, I want to say it was roughly about it's a crucial series had to have been right about 2012 because I know because I threw my very first 250 on it. Mm. And that's about when Optimum Bates got the very first Butch 250. So I had that rod uh, for quite a few years before companies started making really good swim bait rods, you know, with longer butts. And the short butt on a swim bait is just not brutal. It is so bad. I don't know if you've seen the new one that Irod does, that 20 inch handle of cork for uh, the Baileys. Oh, oh it's man. awesome. It is yeah. so awesome. I love having a big, long butt on a rod to throw. It's like throwing an old school jig stick. You're throwing a heavy bait. You need that. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It, and then, like, you go and you fish a, a chatter bait or not a chatter bait, like a crank bait or a jerk bait, and you're fishing like a little 12 and a half inch handle, and it just feels like a toothpick in your hand. <laughs> It, it feels so weird. It it definitely feels incredibly weird. It's I the only thing that I like a shorter butt on is a walker. You mm-hmm. know, if I'm throwing a like a bigger walker, like the I'm a big stick or you know a fin bait or something like that. That's when I'll throw that old. I still throw that old school crucial because it has the perfect butt. It's actually got a really good tip for back then. Right. Yeah. Yeah, back then, swim bait rods, I'm sure, were were pool cues, you know, broomsticks, where where they didn't have too much, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's the word here? Too, there wasn't, they weren't too parabolic. That's the word I was thinking of. Oh yeah, and the technology back then, it was so much different than it is now. Like these guys, there's so many rod makers out there that are just, they're incredible. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, uh, yeah. F5, he makes a great rod. I mean, honestly, I rods, swim bait rods, the, the technology that they put into all that now is just awesome. Yeah. It's impressive to see where things have come, you know? Like, yeah. I always think, man, you know how many fish I would have not lost if I would have had the right rod back in the day? Because yeah. I'm super big on right rod, right bait. Like, I have certain rods that I only put one bait on it. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's all it's made for. It's too perfect for that, and I don't even want to switch it. Yeah, dang, dude. So 2010, that's when you said uh, you and Matt, or that's when you would kind of join Matt's staff. How did how did that kind of, uh, how did that happen? Where did that all start? Wow, that started from, uh, you guys probably know Ian Tucker. Um, it started basically with him. He was, uh, he had a house right down the street from my buddy. And one day we came back from, I don't know what we were doing, probably went surfing or something. And I see a boat out front. I said, let's go down and talk to him. So I go down and start talking to him. We're rapping. He's like, oh, yeah, you know, I I can get this and this. And at that time, I was like loving Vagabond stuff. And he's like, oh, I get all that. I'm like, really? So basically, I gave him money, put in an order, went and got it picked it up and then one more time did the same thing. And then finally Matt goes, give that guy my number. So I got Matt's number and went from there. And then how I found out I was pro staff. I walked into the shop one day, he was on the phone. He goes, Oh, I got to go. One of my pro staffs here. I'm like, all right, I'm pro staff. That's how I found out. <laughs> Dude, that's funny. That's and funny. I would say that it had to have been pretty close to about 12, 13 when I was on it, got his pro staff. Okay. So, that's what I think because that's when the 250 came out. Yeah. The Butch Brown 250. Oh. Yeah, it's got to be right about there. Hopefully, my timelines are not off, but that's I, uh, I, I, <laughs> Yeah. Did, did you know about the 250 before uh, talking with Matt and Ian and all them? Like, was it talked about or was it really just Butch's? bait that he had been fishing that was kind of low key to everybody else i had heard about it but not like talked about all the time i just heard about it and i knew i wanted one i mean as soon as we got that one i still have it too got it went to diamond valley stuck a six and a half pounder on my first day throwing it and the butch brown it's just butch brown i think 
flash trout is the actual name or just mm -hmm. trout uh number four i know that dang dude and at that point in time when you caught that fish you're like okay like maybe maybe this maybe this baits up to something that that or i guess uh did you was it kind of publicly known that butch was catching all these fish at the time or did he sit on this stuff for a while until the bait kind of kind of blew up a little bit he had to have been sitting on it for a while because i didn't really even know much about butch that you got to figure there wasn't like the youtube stuff yeah. there is there wasn't a lot of that stuff and you know i obviously heard about butch the first time through matt and i remember i met him in probably about 2014 for the first time and i was really excited to meet him and i actually met him and shimada the same day oh, <laughs> which man, was nick uh, like two insane swim bait guys i meet on the same day yeah i got a picture somewhere where we're all three in the picture pretty cool was, shot was that when butch filmed that japanese video about the 250 was that trip when uh shimada had come over here do you know i have no idea dude Honestly. i have i have this old uh dvd that uh jeff had sent me and it's all in japanese and it's all about the 250 but it's like they came over here and fished fished with butch and butch kind of talked about how he fished it in english and that's like the only english in the whole video <laughs> wow no i don't even know if i've seen that video dude it's i mean it's all in japanese so you're just watching them and watching how they're working the reel and stuff but it's it's a i didn't even know about the video until somebody had made a comment or somebody talked about it and i was like oh i want to watch this and, and and jeff had sent it to me and i watched it like two or three times and it's like it's honestly like the Japanese version of Southern Trout Eaters. That's the best way to, to, to explain what it is. Oh, yeah. I'd definitely like to watch it. I don't care if I can't understand it anyways. <laughs> I, mean, it, it, I, I, I'm the only guy in the shop that doesn't speak two languages. Have them speak Japanese, too. <laughs> oh, I didn't even think about that. I forgot that, that Matt's really good at Japanese and you got cat. Oh, man, you got you to gotta brush up on your Japanese, I guess. I know. The only thing I know is Ohio. <laughs> good morning. Dude, I didn't even think about that. You're outnumbered at the shop, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Big time. They could be speaking in Japanese and talking about how 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 much uh, how how slow Jeff's working today, and you have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> that's definitely. I guarantee that's how it goes. <laughs> nah, oh, man, that's, that's an awesome. Good friend too. I mean, we've been friends now for a lot of years. That's awesome, dude. That's awesome. So you get actually. First... Oh, go ahead. He's... Talked me into getting this. Is that the one fifteen or the one? It's no, a one forty five. This is before they made him as a slide swimmer. And I went into the shop, and at this point, I started modifying my one forty fives to a slide swimmer. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, really? That's the only color you have? And he's like, Yeah, get it. It will work. I'm like, So I got it. Brought it to my parents' house because they have a pool. Modified a weight to fit inside of it. You know, did the whole thing. Got it to swim awesome. Yeah, I think I had 40, 40 plus something like that. It was over, over that. I'm thinking 45, but up to nine pounds the first day I threw it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So, yeah, he was right on that one. Dang, dude. 145. I don't even know. I don't even think I've seen like that size in person. I think I've really? only ever seen pictures of it. Yeah. Yeah. 145. Actually, it's a great little bait. And, you know, back then it's, I didn't have 50 million swim bait rods. Right. You know what I mean? So it was one of those baits that I could put on a heavier crankbait rod because it had a good parabolic. It wasn't going to shake easy. And, I could throw it. So I would have that in a bigger one. And yeah, it just so happened that that first day after I tuned it, it was like, oh, that was awesome. <laughs> that's that's so sick, man. Uh, since we're on the topic, I'll just ask a question now because I'll forget if not. Did, uh, okay, so you obviously kind of had, uh, you know, quote unquote disposable, you know, uh, you had a way to get 250s and stuff. So you didn't necessarily have to worry about tuning silent killers because you couldn't get a 250 or, or whatever it may be 
do you uh do you like the silent killer and do you prefer the silent killer over or a converted silent kill killer over like the sl sl slide swimmer jeez oh pete's <laughs> <laughs> yeah um no honestly and unless if i converted it maybe mm -hmm. but i've also never converted a new one okay i've only converted ogs um but i do like the silent killer um in the 175 it's my favorite size right time right place it's an awesome bait i don't know if you saw the video that matt did with masa did you see that video on youtube by chance uh i don't think so well he did this thing where he cuts the skin adds more weight and he i mean it dead walks like insane so really actually i'm gonna be modifying one as soon as we get off get get done <laughs> and i'm gonna fish that while i'm out there that's kind of one of my goals is to get some footage on them okay dang no shit huh yeah and then uh, also the new ice cider i want to get some footage on that there's a there's a new one that we just got in the shop and i had to had to grab it. it's not released yet it was released in japan i think two weeks ago they literally just showed up and i'm like yeah matt can i take one <laughs> out to the river <laughs> Get, get, you yeah. some, get you some product pictures it's all business related i swear it is it's a big sucker dude Damn, i mean dude. It, what is that 220 okay yeah 220 so dude it's a bad bad ass bait you know i, I look at it I'm like i like how it swims anyways i've caught fish on them and i've done a few different crazy things to them to modify them make it different yeah well dude i didn't even know about that bait until the, the Virginia gathering when I talked to you and Ian about it Saturday at the show when I stopped and I picked it up and I was like, you know, I don't know what the hell is this? What can you guys tell me about it? I had never heard of it, never seen anything about it. And so I was, I was intrigued. I, I went home and I watched some videos on it on the way, on the way coming back home. And I was like, I have no idea how, how I've never stumbled upon this bait before. That's at that time though. I think it literally was new, but it's, they made a high cider years ago, but it was different. It didn't have a tail. That's why they. I'm pretty sure because they measure this bait. It's a 220, but it's bigger than a 250. Okay. But they measure it without the tail. Okay. And I think they do that because the original high cider didn't have a tail. The mm. the back hook was hanging off the back with a feather. Okay. And it was multi jointed and not as big as the ones they're making now. But mm. yeah, it's the one. I think the one that we had that you saw was like a like one. 75 size yeah. about yeah that's what i was thinking it wasn't as big as one you just picked up <laughs> no like that thing's hunking huh yeah <laughs> like i can't because i mean i've done crazy stuff like like this one i don't know if you if any of the guys saw my ambitious buzz videos i did but i actually took it and put it on top of a big buzz Dude, that is sick well yeah i just hooked myself <laughs> Dude, that, that would be crazy to, to rip that thing on a buzz bait up top yeah it's a i had i don't know the ambitious buzz i just had an excellent summer on and towards the end of it i got the idea so i started messing with it and of course i put it on a split ring do it and it didn't work right so then i'm like you know what it needs more freedom it needs something so three split rings was the key and that was towards the tail end of my uh, ambitious buzz bite and I threw it out got hammered on it almost right away and then I didn't get another bite for the rest of the year because it was on, at the <laughs> tail end of the year and I was like I've been waiting I have been waiting till summertime again the grass grows I can start throwing that I got hammered first cast on it and I'm like please <laughs> so actually it, I think it's on video I think it was on a video I did with cause when I decided to do that and mess with it and okay so it actually shows the swim of it damn damn dude i'm gonna have to check that out <laughs> you just showed me that and that just piqued my interest because i have some spots that that would probably work <laughs> yeah you definitely need to get a couple of, i mean the the buzz part of it matt said i found him in the shop like a while back and basically he's like figure out a way to sell it so i'm like all right i put on a five inch original optimum on it and went out and threw it just i, I had to see and i think i stuck a four 
four and a half the first day. And I got another one. Then I started getting sixes and I'm like, holy crap. And then that day my buddy came out from Blythe. We did a video. We had 25 pounds for our best five fish on it. And you're like, ah, Matt, maybe I don't want to sell this thing, man. Maybe I just want to keep it for us. <laughs> you, you are 100% correct. I was oh, like, man. Oh, man, don't put out the video yet. <laughs> That's funny, dude. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then when the video comes out, my buddy goes, I knew you're throwing a buzz bait. <laughs> I didn't tell even my friends. Oh, dude, that's that's hilarious. That is funny. <laughs> right? do, uh, do you remember getting the getting your hands like on the first new style 250 and then kind of what you thought uh, relative to the OG style? Yes. I actually totally remember that because everybody was talking – I wouldn't say smack about it, but nobody really was into it. But the problem with the OG was it being foam injected. It was, you know, foam filled, which if you got a perfect one, it was awesome. But there was a lot of times it would get air bubbles mm. on one side and it wouldn't swim right. Yeah, That's part of the reason why the ABS was so important. Um, mm. They do swim, in my opinion, a little different, but... I do like them both for different reasons. Right. Most of my OGs, I don't really throw. Um, I have some 250s that are tuned and some that are not because straight out of the box, they're good, you know, on a slow. If you're one of those guys that likes to slow, they're perfect. But I'm a very fast, I work a swim bait really fast, you know, probably because, you know, all those years fishing behind my dad, I, I got used to, to that. it. And, um, like I have a couple two fifties that are literally, it's like a chop bait. Like I can chop it. Screws been pulled out, extended, you know, different things and they're heavier. So you can actually snap it like a jerk bait and it will real quick back and forth. That's, that's sick as hell. That's awesome. I will say. I've never fished an OG, but I like the OG colors that it came in. I had oh, yeah. uh, I had a couple OG 175s, and I know OG doesn't really mean much with the 175s, but some of those colors that I had had, like I had like a brook trout color. It was like brown with purple and yellow like dots and stuff. And I mean, there's just some colors of the OGs, like the Platinum Tiger, uh, blanking on some of the other ones but it's just like damn but then you kind of you got the trade off of the new colors they're coming out with now like that steel trout or whatever butch's newest color with tackle warehouse is and you're kind of you're getting the og colors starting to catch up a little bit but it's like man some of those og colors are just kind of unbeatable it seems like right i totally agree like this color i have wanted in a 250 or something for a long time i haven't been able to get one because I, I don't think they make that color anymore. Right. So you can't you can't find it. And it's like, damn. You know, some of those older colors, which the funny thing is, like, like on a smaller size swim bait, I think different color is better. On a bigger swim bait, going for something as realistic as possible makes the most sense. Yeah. Like you're fishing fast, kind of obnoxiously weird color. I, I think almost has that tendency to piss the fish off and they're like, fuck that thing. I'm going to eat it. You know what I mean? It swims by you like mm, chomp it. Yeah. So yeah, some of those old Japanese crazy, just weird colors are epic. Yeah. Yeah. Some, I mean, oh. some of them are just so, so sick. And like I said, that's not to say that the new style is not getting cool colors too, but I mean, how many, how desirable is an OG 250 in carp or or in the stalker trout? I mean, that's that's the color that everybody wants. When you see a post for OG 250s, that's the color that people are looking for. 100%. It's just 100%. kind of kind of crazy to see. Um, shit, I had a question for you. It's about the 250 stuff. I, I can't remember. Um, I guess what was uh like what was your first experience with, like the boom boom from Optimum? Oh, I actually remember my very first day throwing it because I like soft baits now, probably a little bit more than hard baits because SoCal's 
way oversaturated with swim bait guys, right? Which is good for the business, bad for me personally. But yeah. you know, it is what it is. Things progress, they go. Awesome. People get into stuff. Um the first day I ever threw it, which was the first one that came out was the six inch. Um I had 24 fish on it my first day throwing it. Damn. And I was like Oh my God, this thing is awesome. And then if you I think it was, gosh, I don't even remember, maybe two years later, I'd have to ask Matt on that one. Then they came out with the baby and then that was just game on. Cause it was just, I mean, it's four and a half inches long. It's just a smashable bait. Right. And I got so addicted to throw it. I was throwing that thing all the time. And when it came out, that's before I had my boat. So I was able to do things different and still fish it faster and throw, still be throwing a swim bait, even though it's smaller with my dad mm -hmm. and smashing fish on it. You know, when you go, we'd, we'd take a trip to the river and I'd come back with a pile of ones that are just chewed to hell. Yeah. You know, like a huge pile. It's just like oh, such a good bait because, okay, I'm going to tell you my favorite thing in the world to throw though is a frog, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where the boom, boom. And I kind of really connected is I'm throwing the weedless and I'm throwing it deep into stuff. You know, there's times I've fished it with straight 50 pound braid, throwing it so back in the toolies and, you know, working it out. Yeah. And it was kind of that same, same thing for me where getting deep into something and bringing your bait out and getting a blow up or, you know, bit and be able to get that fish out it's just a good feeling man i don't know what i like about it but flipping into deep cover and it's it's all a chance yeah it's speaking of that uh that boom or boom boom and, and frog that boom boom frog rod have you messed with one of those before are you talking about the the, the older one? the the i rod the 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 new dobbins one my buddy had one and i picked it up and Dude, that thing for a frog rod is feels like a telephone pole. Feels like you could rip a fish apart if you wanted to. Oh, really? Yeah. No, I haven't seen it. I I'm pro staff for I rod, so I right. fish. I would say ninety percent of their stuff. Like I've got an F five and I've got a Phoenix, a few Phoenix and this and that. But honestly, their seven fifty four air to me, it's got a good tip, and I like to walk a frog. Mm. You know, back through stuff, huck it deep and walk it out and that's why i like just a little bit of tip too much now the broomstick is great for heavy mat cover and all that 100 percent. like if you have thick moss which the funny thing is unless i go to a pond here none of my lakes get moss i don't get any of that at all you know most of our lakes are literally a toilet bowl surrounded in toolies yeah you know, it's the typical SoCal lakes, you know, at least most of them down my way. You start going, you know, north, like, you know, Pyramid and all that is different. But mm -hmm. the ones that are close to me, like I'm 10 minutes from Lake Skinner. And yeah, it's basically Thule surrounding the whole lake. I mean, right. <laughs> not a whole lot of excitement. Yeah. Dang. So huh, you, you talk about the, 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 the baby boom, boom. And I was kind of, kind of piqued my interest. Like I might have to, I might have to find one of the, one or two of those and fishing for smallmouth in the river. If you're saying oh. you're, you're going out and you're hammering them on the river that I was just like, I was, you were saying that and I'm like, man, I, I mean, maybe I need to get myself a couple of those. <laughs> All right. Yep. Had, to, had to use the, the bathroom little potty break there, but Picking up where we were leaving off, left off, talking about optimum uh, depths, and actually we would just kind of talk before we started recording um, of all the 250 variants. You got the shutter tail, the shutter fall, and maybe they're you know silent killer, sl slide swimmer, that sort of thing. And um, so I guess we'll talk about the shuttle shutter. Jeez, oh, Pete's shutter shutter tail first. So the shutter tail, it's got like kind of a like a hard plastic boot tail on it, right? Am I kind of explaining that right? I guess. 100%. And, you know, they came out with one years ago. Like, I have an OG one that's uh, 175. Mm -hmm. I actually think I have it right here somewhere. Um, and then the tail was a little bit smaller, and it was weighted a lot lighter. So 
it was a very slow cranking bait mm. where the new shutter tail it's weighted awesome you can burn it across the surface and because that bulbous tail it puts off like almost like a prop wash like it wakes across the surface insane um i've used it a little bit i haven't fished it tons yet um stuck one really big fish on it that i straightened my hook out on at clear lake and i'm guessing he was probably about eight pounder um that's because i changed my hooks and did something i shouldn't have done but i was trying to do super thin light wire hooks to get bit and yeah i blew that one but yeah this the swim on it is just it's very unique it doesn't swim like anything out there because there's a joint in the bait so the head nods and the tail moves and it's definitely a, I, I know that bait's going to just wreck him at the right time. Right. hundred percent. That's uh that's interesting. Is there a video on the YouTube channel uh, of the shutter tail? hundred percent. If you okay. go, I believe it's casting blast because okay. it's a depth web member item. Mm. Oh. Sorry, my battery just said I'm getting low. Oh, you're good. It says I'm at 20%, so we okay. should still be fine. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> on castandblast.com, you can go on there and see video footage of the shutter tail. And I believe it's also on Optum Bait's YouTube as well. Okay. Um, I'm not positive, though. But, yeah, if if you wanted, if anybody wanted one, they just go on castblast.com. You can order any of the depths web member, you know, code name bass, any of the, the, the Udo, um, which there's only a few of those even left. And then, you know, the, the flat tail bulldoze and then the shutter tail bull shooter, all those web member items. Heck yeah. Which dude. the, the flat tail bulldoze, I love that thing. It it goes like six feet. And with that tail being flat, you can literally burn it. Hmm. And it keeps it super stable. I mean, yeah. I stuck stuck a pretty good one on it one day. I mean, about six and a half. I didn't weigh it, but I get about six and a half. Damn. Yeah, those are those are the two newest variations of the 250 in, in the uh bulldoze bull shooter. And I, I don't think like I have seen very many people talk about it or, or, or post about it, but you know, it's, it's, when did they come out last year? They come out last year, like later in the fall. Yeah. They were okay. just re I want to say we released them end of September or beginning of October. It was oh. almost the same time that we released the Glideway. Okay. So, so yeah. So you guys, like when you and Ian were at the Virginia show, like you guys, had the first you know shipment or two of those baits when you guys brought them over there yeah damn okay see i didn't even realize they were that new so yeah they haven't even been around for a full season cycle yet so i mean those are baits that that might start to pop off here when it gets a little bit warmer in in the rest of the country and so i mean that's probably why i haven't seen very many of them that would explain it (laughs) right 100 percent. i mean it's it's a new bait that they're usually when we get a bait we'll get something early enough to be able to put some time in. Like when we got the glide, I got my first prototype of it all the way back a year ago, like a year and a few months ago. Hmm. And first came in and Matt's told me thinking about, you know, bringing this bait in and he gave me one to go fish. First day I went out, I stuck two on it and I was just like, all right, I'm down. I mean, last year, the amount of fish that I caught on the glideway was insane. Yeah. Let's uh let's keep the glideway talk to a minimum because I actually have one and it's a sick ass bait and I don't want anybody else to buy them yet. Okay. So, no so we'll uh, <laughs> we'll keep it to a minimum. Actually, when you guys are hearing this episode, uh here in the next couple of days, Wednesday, when I do the bait overview, it's gonna be the glideway because I've been fishing it and it's a sick bait. The options they have are really, really cool. Um, but you guys, if you guys don't know about it, you'll see it in the next couple of days. But yeah, super, super sick bait. And I, uh, that's a bait that I feel like is going to get to be very popular here in the next year or two, because you can do some crazy shit with that thing. hundred percent, hundred percent can fish it 
I mean, if you're a novice, I would say you never threw a glide bait, perfect bait to throw. If yeah. you know how to fit them, great bait to throw. I mean, all the way around. And price point's awesome. But I won't talk about it anymore. We got <laughs> we got to make sure that, that I can stock up on them before, before we start talking about it too much. Oh, right. Um, I know, though, we're supposed to be getting uh, – there should be two more sizes coming out hopefully this year so oh, hell yeah so you guys have the 178 right that's the only size you guys have and it's the only size that's available pretty much right now correct okay cool and they've got there's some sick colors there's uh that winter soldier is like a green olive color i've got the gold rush which is just literally straight gold and then i have um Oh man, I don't even know what color it is. I don't even remember looking at it. I just ripped it out of the package to tie it on. But I've been messing around with it for the past like two weeks, and it's a it's a really really cool bait. But we'll talk about that later. Um, so we talked about the bulldozer and bull shooter flat tail, the two fifty variant. We talked about the shutter shutter tail, and I actually I've talked about the shutter fall a handful of times on the podcast, and guys kind of hear about it and my little bit of knowledge that I have on it. And after I talked to you and Ian at the Virginia gathering, it was kind of like, Hey, I have this really weird 250 that has a ball joint in the middle that, that kind of, you know, sways on the fall. You guys kind of talked about it and, and elaborated on, on what you guys know about it. So I guess from what, you know, kind of explain what it is, because I don't know if I, since I had learned, I don't think I'd ever gone in depth from kind of what you guys had explained to me. All right. From what I know, I actually don't own one, but, they're made for fishing like a rock wall. So as it falls, it shimmies mm -hmm. down. Um, that's basically what I know about. It's for, you know, deeper ledges, rock walls, you know, high spots to drop off, whatever. Just, and yeah, I believe Ian has a few of them. I'm sure he does. Um, Cause he's the one that kind of told me about it. That's right. why I don't have tons of information. If I actually, had one i would definitely have a lot more information but right. it's definitely if if you're in you know we'll say an arizona lake that has right. those steep cliffs or something like that definitely a bait to have because it, the way it falls from what i've seen on it it's just that shimmy is just incredible yeah it uh from from what i know and granted it's it's even less than you know and uh I've only the only ones I've ever had were all pink. And then there's another color of like a it's like a gray carp color with like red gills. And those are the only two colors I've ever seen it in. And nobody really knows about it. Like <clears throat> I'll see cotton candy pink 250s for sale and I'll say, is this a shutterfall? And guys are like, what the hell is a shutterfall? It's a 250. And I'm like, okay, never mind then. <laughs> and so um the I think they also made it in I think the color is called rad scale, okay. but I not a hundred percent positive on that. Okay. Um, I, I know they made it in a few different colors. Um, I had actually, the funny thing is I haven't seen or heard anybody talk about it in a long time because they, they came out quite a few years ago and it was just one of those things that depths did that like depths does take something to a different level where it's, <clears throat> A bait that is way more technical than something else. You're fishing it in a totally different way, totally different structure. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's kind of like, we'll just say when, when the Clash first came out, all the different ways you can fish it, you know, became, you know, huge. Mm -hmm. A lot you can do with a bait means a lot of different fish you can catch, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> Funny enough, um, I've never caught a regular 250 fish. I've only ever caught fish on the shutterfall, and all the fish I've caught were on the pause on the fall. And I've always just marked it up to being like like how a Yamamoto Senko shimmies on the fall, and it's kind of got that secondary action. That's I've caught a lot of smallmouth and I've caught a lot of largemouth, and that's kind of in my brain. I'm like, yep, it shimmies like a Senko. That's why they're gonna eat it like that. So whether that's exactly what it is or not i just always assume that that secondary action is is more than the bait just sitting there not doing anything it's kind of got uh it's got another step of realism to it and and my fish don't seem to mind so i've sold two and i have i bought another one so i i have a pink cotton candy one that i've caught a couple pike on haven't caught any bass on it yet but 
up on Lake Michigan, man, those, those fish, they can't handle a pink cotton candy 250, let alone one that shimmies on the fall. So I'm going to, I'm probably going to keep this one. I probably keep it for a while. <laughs> you know, pink, it's a very underrated color. I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of people that don't like it, but pink gets bit like really well. I will you say know? a pink 250, like the 250 is, is, you know, a piece of art. It's a, very beautiful bait to look at. It's aesthetically pleasing to look at. You throw a cotton candy pink paint job on it, dude. That thing looks uglier than sin. I look at it sometimes sitting in my box and I'm just like, what the hell is this thing? Like, I can't even believe I catch fish on this thing. <laughs> it's got the pink and it's got the the really turquoise cotton or like turquoise blue colored eyes. And I'm just like, this thing, I don't know if it pisses the fish off or their fish are just feel bad and eat this thing, take it out of its misery. I don't know, but it's a, <laughs> it's a, Interesting looking bait to say the least. 100%. But that goes back to what I was saying earlier about mm -hmm. the different weird colors sometimes are so productive that, yeah. you know, you have your lifelike ones, you know, like the natty trout, you know, all your other ones, but then you get that weird color. Like, I mean, I guess that's kind of lightning trouty, right. but I can tell you right fishing, there's never been a trout in that lake. Right. And, <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes there's something about that oddball color. Like my buddy, Daniel Jones, Virginia. I mean, he loved that pink and white. That pink phony. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I've had it before where I had ponds. Cause you know how ponds are. You blow them out. If you fish them too much and I couldn't get bit on anything through the pink and started wrecking them. That's all it took. It was weird. I actually got to see that one time and experience where I threw everything under the sun, could not get bit, had pink, started wrecking them. <laughs> man, it's funny how that stuff works sometimes. <laughs> right. It's crazy. Oh man. That's uh, yeah. I will say I've, I've ran into that too, fishing some spots up at home. Um, so talked about, talked about a lot of the baits and everything that I kind of had. So gear, you kind of talked about uh, fish and eye rod and stuff. What, uh, you know, two, two, three of your combos that you're always going to go out with, whether they're swim bait or conventional stuff, what are the three or four combos that are always on your deck, no matter what, wherever you're going? Uh, pretty much the new Bailey's Corcus. It's, I think, a two to four ounce rod, and that is literally my glideway rod. It's perfect. It's an eight foot rod. It's awesome for it. Um, next one would be the XL swim, which I throw my Papa Boom Boom on, okay. which is one of my favorite baits. That's another bait, actually. Uh, when sorry, I'm going to get off topic. No, um, Matt had made it, and he's like, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm going to release it because it's such a long bait. And, you know, you put a 12-0 in it. I don't know how the hook hook set's going to be. If you're going to miss a lot of fish, just get bites, you know, so on and so forth. So I started fishing one. I, I actually set one to uh, Daniel in Virginia. He actually got the first fish on it. He beat me. Um, and then I started getting fish on it. And it was just, I had no problem with the hook set. I'm like, this thing's awesome. It goes through trees. I'm fishing it deep into trees and all this stuff. I'm like, I absolutely love this bait. Mm. I think the first fish I caught it was like five and a half pounds. I actually caught fish that were four pounds on it. You know, it's an eight inch rubber lure yeah. with a 12 0 hook in it. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, but, works, works good enough. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no problem on that one. I That's a great bait to fish. I love fishing that thing. Um, but back to the eye rods. Um, I I always, right time of year, always got my 754 Air, which is my frog rod with 50 pound. Um, usually on the Papa, I'm throwing 20 pound Seaguar. Um, on the Glideway, I'm fishing uh, 15 pound Seaguar. And most of the time, I'm, I like, uh, you know, six to one gear ratio. Every now and then I'll fish a little bit faster or even a little bit slower. Like my 250 rod, I like, uh, it's a five, three to one. Wow. <laughs> and 
I think a lot of that has to do with one, the power. So when you hang a fish with the lower gear ratio, you don't have to pump and fight the fish. Mm -hmm. You can put your rod down and crank and never yeah. have to loosen that hook slot because I mean, I've dumped a lot of fish out of 250 because I mean, you shake a six ounce bait, it's going to go flying, especially mm -hmm. if you pour a hole in it. Right. Yeah. So to not have to pump, in my opinion, I like, I go anywhere. I only have a couple of five threes. One of them's on a wake bait rod, you know, for fishing bigger wake baits. And that's just because I can crank faster and not have to worry about it going down. I don't like wake baits that go underwater. I like them to stay across the surface. And the other one's on my 250 rod. Other than that, it's 6'3 or 7'3. Uh, Dang, you kind of got me intrigued wanting to try a slower gear ratio now. Because I've only ever fished like HGs, like Corrado HGs and stuff. And that's what I fish everything on. But what you're saying makes a lot of sense about pumping the rod and, and kind of winching them in with a slower gear ratio. So I might, I might have to pick up one of those slower uh, Corrados and kind of mess around with it because that that's really intriguing with, with what you're saying. hundred percent. And I could tell you like one back in the day, they didn't make your Calcutta, I think was what five to one, like five to one. Yeah. It was the fast version. <laughs> I mean, that was, Calcutta 400 was literally my swim bait reel. You know what I mean? And then they came out with the Corrado 300, this and that. But the the power you have on that lower gear ratio, it's like, like let's say you go rock fishing, right? You're fishing a couple hundred feet of water. Do you want an eight to one? No. You're going to tire yourself out so bad. Mm -hmm. Lower gear ratio, you have more power on the turn, mm -hmm. right? So you're not going to have to pump the rod. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people. They think I'm crazy, but I mean, my style is a little bit different than a lot of people's anyway. Right. <clears throat> yeah, it, it makes sense. And you also got to think it's easy in, in my mind, just speaking it. I don't know. I've never done it. It's easier to fish a slow reel fast than fish a fast reel slow. 100%. That's yeah. another reason. Because I'm, I'd have to say I'm a little ADD, so that's probably why I fish a lot faster than a lot of people. I just, one, I want to cover water, you know, different times of year, if the water's cold, I obviously slow it down, but, um, I like to cover water. Like I will literally, if I go to my home lake, I will fish pretty much the lake and my spots twice, mm. you know, because one, our lakes, our lakes here are not very big. You know what I mean? Like I could like my home lake, you can only go 10 miles an hour, but if I pinned it and went as fast as I could in my boat, I would make it all the way around the whole lake and back in about five minutes. <laughs> you know, what I mean? like, yeah. and I don't even have a boat. I got a tracker with a 90 on it. Right. <laughs> you know? So I'm, I'm maxing out at 45. So yeah. I'm not even all it ass. Right. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. Um, it's like our biggest lake around here is Diamond Valley, and I make it from one side to the other, pinned, and I don't know, probably ten minutes. Hmm. Damn, I'm trying to think. Like a lot of the lakes here, I'm fishing are like 150 acres, <laughs> not very big at all. I mean, you can, you can, I can paddleboard around them in probably about 20 minutes. I can go all the way around if I was really not fishing at all, just started at one end, gone down to the other. I mean, we fished, we fished some lakes yesterday that are all connected. It's like a big chain link or, or chain connection of lakes. And I mean, in five hours with, we fished up the whole chain and came back down with wind blowing us backwards on the way back. And I mean, we fished it in five hours. Like we didn't leave any wow. stoned unturned. Like it was and I don't know how big those lakes are, but I was like, wow, fishing pretty damn fast, <laughs> fishing pretty damn fast today. I mean, we were casting a whole bunch of fishing jerk baits and spinner baits and, and softies and stuff. But I was just like, man, really a 200 acre lake is not very big at all. And I mean, even, even some lakes up at home that are bigger, that are connected to Lake Michigan, you could fish them in probably two or three hours. You could fish a lot of their shoreline in a short amount of time up there. 
and uh, just kind of kind of makes you realize that how fast or how slow you fish based on how long it takes you to fish some of those lakes. Oh, 100 percent. But there's also I have spots where certain times of year I don't even yeah. go to the east ends. Right. You know, this and that. And so, yeah, I, I can literally fish Skinner all my spots easily in three hours, like yeah. where I want to fish or less. And that would be like start it by the buoy line and just go down the whole side, you know, right. I mean, spots I like better, but there's also areas. I mean, when, you, when you have a lake surrounded by toolies, there could be fish anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so I'm not chance that and let that go. Granted, I have my spots that I know I love fish on it, certain things, but caught them in weird random spots where oh, i never caught one here before you know what i mean right yeah 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 that makes a lot of sense um last question for you i guess just just a zinger for you what are the top three or four videos on the uh on the optimum youtube channel like if you had to pick pick three that you enjoyed watching or enjoyed recording or, or whatever it may be what are like your top three that you would suggest somebody to go watch are you talking ones that I did the SoCal Crusher episodes. Just, just any of them. Any, we'll go maybe the SoCal Crusher episodes. Three, your top favorite from there, and then three that are just on the channel from whatever they may be. If they're the ball and videos or Glideway videos, whatever they are. Well, there was definitely the the Ballon video that Matt went up and fished with Josh Paris on. That was awesome. I mean, it didn't get tons of views because they were spotted bass, so right. they weren't huge. And that's one thing I've noticed, you know, you, you catch, you stick a big fish, you're going to get the views. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite one that I ever did with cause, honestly, that day I caught two fish. One of them was probably 12 inches long on a jerk bait. Um, Cause in the video I will fish, you know, if Matt wants me to, we got something new in whatever yeah. I'll go fish that like the video, there's actually a video coming out uh, tonight at six o'clock that uh is me throwing the new evoke uh oki car mm. oki bra color and it was right before we went to oklahoma and i was trying to get footage and i had about a three and a half hour window and i think i stuck like eight or nine fish and the biggest one was five and a half pounds and it was like all right <laughs> <laughs> but yeah there's one that uh I was at Lake Paris. I don't know what number it is, but I got a seven three on the baby boom boom. And just, I would have to say the reason why it's my favorite is because of how uh, cause Miracu big baits and Cali did the editing. I mean, it was, you know, black and white to, it, it, it was just a very well done video. Mm. That, that would be one of my favorites with the one with Matt. And then, uh, um, the clear lake footage was good. I don't know. There's, there's a lot of videos on there that are really good. You know, there's some good, like with Berto came out from Spain when we first got the glideways. Yeah. And, um, Matt asked me to take him fishing. That's a, I will, I will stop you and say that is a kick-ass video. I, that, that's one of my top videos. That's a really, <laughs> really good video. <laughs> yeah. There's a little bit of profanity in that one, but so no I, sorry, no sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I never even, you know, met him. And, and Matt's like, taking fishing. I'm like, the fishing here just wasn't like, I I have confidence that he's going to get a, a glide bait fish. It just didn't have the confidence. I said, hey, can I take the river for a couple of days? He's like, sure. So we go out to the river and I'm nervous because I'm like thinking, I got to get this guy a fish. And we launched the boat in this backwater. We have, you have to launch in the dirt in some of the spots. And uh, it was literally like eight minutes in. He stuck that 7-2. I was just like, that's when we both lost it. We both started freaking out. And then I got a six and a half. And he got another like three pounder. And it was just like incredible. Yeah. So I back second half to the video the next day. The cameras, his camera wasn't on and he was prototyping his, one of his other ones, which I actually, he 
gave me. Mm. It's the smaller size Glideway that should be coming out. Mm. I mean, he destroyed the smallmouth, destroyed them. And that was the day that I actually hugged my PB smallmouth. I know, I don't know how big it was. It jumped, I'm guessing about five pounds and it shook my Glideway, but it was definitely the biggest smallmouth I've ever hooked. Damn. You guys, yeah, was, you, guys will, you guys will have to take a depth optimum field trip up here and we could it I mean there's some there's some smallmouth up here that are seven, eight pounds that I don't think have ever seen a swim bait before. No well, I know they yeah. haven't seen a swim bait before because guys catch them on drop shots all the time, but never never anything too crazy like a swim bait. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be pretty awesome. Actually, Matt was showing me today Rumbanis got some really nice smallmouth on uh on the boom boom mm. he was wrecking and then my buddy where i'm going to tomorrow he just had man i think he had like five smallmouth over three pounds on a glide yeah. bait damn dude i'm pretty excited about it <laughs> yeah. i mean even even going out to like saint Clair, you guys you guys would catch so many four pounders. You'd go back and you'd never want to go try to catch another smallmouth again. <laughs> it's, wow. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, I'd only ever been there once. And last year I went, it was like crappy out. It was snow and it was this time last year. And we finished with just shy of 30 pounds. And I was just, I was like, I don't know if I can ever come back to this place. I just, I just spoiled myself with smallmouth fishing for the rest of my life. <laughs> you had 30 pounds. Mouth? No, we, well, I will say we had a seven pound large mouth that day, but I mean, we weren't, we weren't able to, able to cull four pound small mouth, like a four pound small mouth wasn't even getting a picture. It was just getting tossed back. So we were trying to catch more fives. Just a wow. crazy, yeah. crazy day. That would probably make me like small mouth. Oh, sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> my battery's down to 10. Um, that would probably make me like smallmouth fishing better because my whole reason why I don't like smallmouth is because I want to catch a big fish. Right. You know, yeah, four pound smallmouth is a good one, but it's like, yeah, I know it sounds so bad, <laughs> but I just, I don't know. The large mouth, that big old bucket mouth on it and everything. I love that. Yeah. When we get off of here, I'll send you a couple, uh, a couple smallmouth that get caught up by my way. Um, <laughs> uh last last thing to cover uh what are your social medias where can people follow you if they're not following you already um i'm socal crusher on instagram perfect and then your youtube videos are on optimum's youtube page right yes under okay. socal i actually am getting ready to start my own youtube channel i'm just kind of my wife is we can kind of edit we're kind of starting to get, as you know, I'm not a techie guy. So I just want to put, I've got so much footage mm-hmm. from the past couple of years. Like I never even filmed until Cause and Matt came up to me one day and said, Hey, we want to do some filming and, and do like a show. And that's how it all came about. And I thought it was going to be a show with all of our pro staff. And I'm yeah. like, Oh, let's, Oh, it's SoCal Crushers, you know, with an S. Mm-hmm. And it ended up only being me and it stayed at SoCal Crusher because I, I didn't know like what the plan was. And that's <laughs> literally started filming because I didn't, I'm not tech enough to learn how to use a GoPro. Yeah. So all the time filming with cause, that's how I learned how to use a GoPro. So all my footage is literally within like two and a half years. Dang. I never filmed before that. Dang, man. Well, you're do, you make it headway at it. I'm sure whenever you you do your own YouTube channel and stuff, you'll figure it out because it's more of a figure out or sink or swim thing is kind of what it comes down to. And and you just got to remember if you catch fish, people do not care what the video looks like. If you go out and hammer two fives in a video, you could you could make it a PowerPoint presentation and people would watch it. <laughs> right. And and you know it it's fun and it's I like doing the informational side like people my kids and friends will tell me like i teach when i fish yeah you know, like i don't even mean to but like my buddy i'll be like oh yeah I cast over there or you know this is a good spot or you know whatever and i guess i've always done it i never even realized it like when 
Matt first brought the show to me, I was like super nervous, like right. being on camera. Uh, and my my friends like, bro, you just talk to me and tell me how to fish all day long. Mm -hmm. You can do it. You're gonna be just fine. And I never even realized it. And it's just something fun to me. Like I don't even mind showing my spots. I, mm -hmm. I don't care about that because. Yeah, if somebody goes out and catches a fish of their lifetime, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm stoked. You know what I mean? And I'll catch one another spot. Who cares? Right. Heck yeah. A lot of spots. Hey. Yeah, good way to look at it, man. Good way to look at it. But as always, I'll put all Jeff's uh, – I'll put a link to uh, Jeff's YouTube videos and then also his Instagram page in the show notes. You guys can go follow him if you're not already. Jeff, I want to thank you for coming on, man. It was kind of – Kind of short notice. You you said you had a trip coming up, so we we're like, "Oh, does today work?" And I was like, "Today works perfectly." So we got it all planned, and uh, we just knocked. I think this honestly might be about an hour and a half, hour forty five episode. I, I'm not sure. I didn't keep wow. track of the time, but decently long episode. I feel like with some good information on on some stuff. I feel like you're the first guy who uh, who's kind of gone in depth depth with the depths and optimum stuff. And obviously, it seems like probably couldn't pick a better guy to to do that with. So I appreciate you coming on, man. And I, I hope you had a good time. And like I said, as always, I'll put all Jeff's stuff in the show notes. You guys can go follow him if you don't already. And as always, guys, I hope you enjoyed the episode and I'll talk to you guys next time. See you guys.